I'm going to talk about uh, time series water column measurements in, in Saanich Inlet and basically introduce the Boyd Profile uh, System. Now, it, this will probably, some of the data here will illustrate the fact that if you uh, single uh, cast of, of uh, CTD cast are often cannot represent what's happening because they change in a very sort of rapid sort of uh, uh, way, and you need to have this longer time series of regular cast. So it's, it's an interesting sort of segue from the last call, where we saw great changes in Harrow, Harrow Strait. It's hard to determine whether that was a change due to uh, uh, a, 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 a aliasing issue, or it was actually a long-term change in the uh, conditions in Harrow Strait. So I gave this talk in, at, or a bulk portion of this talk at, uh, at last year's CMOS, and these are my co-authors, uh, but they basically have not seen this talk, and any errors and wild speculations are strictly due to me, so I just thought I'd leave their names on there. So oh, this is the situation in the, north, in the uh, Northeast Pacific now. Uh, those green dots are boy profiling systems or vertical profilers. Uh, just this last year, we, we managed to get a group of them off of uh, the Ocean Observing Initiative. There's five off the coast of Oregon. And one out at Station Papa. So basically, this type of measurements are going to be much more prevalent in the uh, uh, literature, I think. It'll be interesting to see how that changes our understandings. So our situation here is basically in Saanich Inlet, I'm sure you all recognize this. We're about three kilometers south of, our Boyd profiler is about three kilometers south of the uh, Innsbruck platform, and it looks like uh, this creature here. So it's, a, it's about a 30 uh, foot across surface platform. It's an old CPEX boy, if people remember that experiment. Uh, and here it's leaving the uh, uh, seaplane dock and heading off to its position over there. It's based basically right in the middle of the tailway at the, the beginning of the deep basin, so it's about 200 meters of water. And it's a narrow kind of area here, so it might be representative of what's happening throughout the, the, the width of the, uh, uh, the uh, inlet. Whereas if you, out here, there seems to be quite a bit of uh, cross-channel uh, variability. Okay, here it's made out of two components, basically. Uh, the the float and the profile package, and it's moored in this three-point uh, 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 system. And here's the float. Basically, the float, as I mentioned before, has quite a bit of room to do stuff on it, so there's a bit of real estate there. Uh, it currently carries a MET station, uh, temperature and uh, pressure, relative humidity, wind speed and direction, as well as a downward-looking 200 kilohertz echo sensor. The, pack, the profiling package, which profiles the entire water column, basically is, is stowed at depth to minimize fouling, and it, it uh, rises to the surface uh, and <coughs> measures basically CTD, stuff, uh, CTD uh, oxygen sensors, uh, both a fast, uh, fast response RINCO and SB43, uh, fluorescence with a wet labs eco FLNTU, and backscatter turbidity and also a path length uh, transversometer. Steve, how deep is the instrument package when it's at the bottom of the floor? When it's at, when it's how high is it? Yeah. I actually. How far below the you, water? Your shallowest data point is about three and a half meters. Yeah. It is, but we, when, when we're actually looking at the data, we tend to, that, that gets so noisy there, we tend to remove a lot of that, uh, that data. And, uh, uh, so it, yeah, it, we're, we're, I can't remember what my first data point is. It, 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 I, basically, it's, it's deeper than that, though. It, it's very noisy up there. I, I don't know how much the, the float itself affects the data at that. Uh, but those are still open questions. But, so we're recovering the VPS this, uh, this spring, and it's going to have uh, some instruments that we'll be able to remove off the VPS and put on to the BPS. Probably the PCO2 sensor and nitrate sensor. So we'll have those additional instruments and basically we have this new instrument that the cache is working diligently to uh, procure. It's an underwater vision profiler. It's based on this uh, uh, zoo scan uh, uh, 
instrument, which was a, a laboratory instrument, basically using a scanner with red light. You put your sample in the scanner, and it scans the uh, animals in the, uh, the fluid, and there's some automatic uh, identification uh, uh, software that figures out what's, what's there. In this case, basically it has a, a about a 20 centimeter square uh, area where it illuminates with red light, and then there's a camera on top of it that takes a picture of those things about uh, 20 times a second, and you can get an idea of uh, possibly predator-prey relations and stuff like that. Um, here's some samples of what it, it puts out. Um, basically, I think there's automatic uh, identification for a lot of these things, and we should be able to be, it should be a really valuable sort of uh, uh, addition to what we're getting from the SAP that's uh, looking down, so we can sort of ground truth the exact data with what uh, what the, this uh, profiling system is measuring. And there'll be some avoidance issues, obviously, but it'll be, it gives us a better idea of what the uh, what the, uh, the abundances, abundances are of different uh, uh, animals. Anyhow, so basically the the data I'm going to be looking at uh, was collected in 2014, beginning around July, where it was manually operated for two cycles a day until about December uh, or uh, December of 2014, where we got automated. There was a lot of dedication to do those two cycles a day for about uh, six months. And then it was automated until February, and where it developed a ground fault. And we've been slow, slow to repair it, but it's back in action now uh, since uh, January of 18th. And we've got it running at four cycles a day. Basically, at noon, it comes to the surface. It takes about a half hour to get it up to the surface, which I noted is almost exactly the same timing as low plankton, so it's, it's an interesting coincidence. And then it goes back down to the uh, seafloor to uh, about 10 to 1. So this happens at midnight and noon and 6 and 6, basically. But this could be modified in any type of way with any kind of input from anybody in here to uh, possibly be a, a better sampling uh, arrangement. Um, currently, we're trying to limit it to four, four cycles a day and see how long we can get this thing to last because it'd be really good to have a continuous year-long cycle anyway before we have to go in there, replace the tether, which tends to wear out due to uh, cycling. Okay, so this is, this is the now famous... <laughs> It samples both ways. Now, so there will be a wake problem. Yes. Yes. So it's but it samples all the time. But yeah, it's on all it the is. time, but we we take the down as the you know idea of past. And I I actually can't remember how I I sort of I, I kept the data over an eight month period. And I don't remember how I sort of where I got rid of the up and down cast. I don't think I I think I just mashed it all together at, at this point, but. Uh, Anyways, here's the uh, here's here's Anne's paper, I guess, and, and Dario's and uh, 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 Frank's paper, uh, basically a, a, a plot from it. And most of the uh, conclusions here or the uh, thoughts here come from that paper, anyway. So Santa Inlet, probably as you might have heard in previous talks, is, is a quite a peculiar fjord. It's uh, north facing. It's uh, it's uh, 20, 24 kilometers long. Uh, not particularly deep, greater, just greater than 200 meters, and it's got a very wide and broad and, and deep sill, basically encompassing this region up here and here, all through that whole area. So it's, it's not, not straight at fjord. Uh, the processes that uh, control fjords, uh, physical processes, don't really exist. Uh, basically it has very little uh, estuarine input in the head, and probably more from Shawnee Creek, and often has been considered a reverse estuary where the fresh water is out here, flowing into the estuary and, and uh, then pushing water out from the, the, the bottom. And that's not the regular estuary circulation. Also, the fact that it's northward facing like this and sort of surrounded by this land mass here is protected from the strong south, uh, easterly and southwesterly winds in the winter. Uh, it doesn't have any catabatic kind of winds, so there's no snow capped peaks on either side of it. And uh, the, the daily sea breeze and land breeze effect doesn't really occur the same way it does in other shores because most of it is happening up in, in the uh, Fraser River Valley. So it's, it's, weekly, it's weekly mixed. The bottom waters, of course, are, which makes it really interesting, are usually devoid of oxygen. So here's a, uh, uh, this 
probably has been shown before. This is our 10 years, 10 years now time series of, uh, of uh, uh, water properties at uh, the uh, Venus instrument platform. Basically, we're going to look at a uh, period here that matches nicely with the period that was looked at before by uh, Karen Manning and others. Uh, we just found out it was an undergraduate student. That was an excellent paper that she managed to get together. Um, and basically, it shows that both these years were anomalous years. The, their year was the El Nino, and ours was this precursor to, uh, uh, was basically a, a blob year. And you can see the effects of the actual water properties here are quite similar to the uh, El Nino year. You can sort of see that the density is very, very evident. That it's a different, uh, different th that there's effects from the blob, or the conditions that cause the blob are affecting the, uh, the conditions in San Chino the same way. And one of the main finds is that we basically show that what Manning et al. found in, in 2009 or whenever the paper was published are, are repeated in, in our paper. Okay, so here's, uh, here's some plots of, of the BPS data from uh, July till uh, February. Basically, we have uh, uh, salinity, temperature, and, and density. And the, the, the things to pick out of here is this uh, sort of fortnightly, monthly kind of cycling happening in all the, all the structures, all the uh, plots here. And the fact that there's a very strong change from summer to winter modes. Uh, the density does uh, remain more uh, consistent throughout the year because there's uh, basically it's controlled mostly by salinity that doesn't change as much, but any kind of uh, fresh water inputs are balanced by cooling with the surface water. Or, so you have to get a very consistent uh, density profile. Um, so I'm going to basically use oxygen as a proxy for re renewal. Um, basically the Inlet itself is, is, is just depleting oxygen by respiration, and we expect that the oxygen that the oxygen water is coming in from outside of the actual uh, inlet at, uh, from different mixing regions, and we try to trace the, the flow of the water that way. So I've bro broken up, up into uh, uh, four areas that see they're, they're kind of distinct. It's pretty obviously distinct here at the surface, uh, down to about 30 meters or so, a mid-depth uh, uh, region a deep region and this very bottom region. Now, at the surface, we see we've got both uh, what looks like monthly and uh, uh, fortnightly pulses in the end of the summer here, uh, some cessation of events here, and then a steady fortnightly kind of cycling happening um, during the winter months that we've observed. Uh, Mid-depth, similar sort of pulses happening and, and a out of phase uh, fortnightly pulsing happening uh, during the winter months. And the deep, you can't really see that well, but in this plot, there's some input of newer water during the uh, uh, fall, uh, fall period. And the bottom stays the same throughout this uh, particular sample period. So if we want to try to understand the, the phasing and time and stuff, I'm just using uh, basically pressure from uh, the Venus, uh, in, the Venus in instrument platform, but we know that the mixing is occurring that's generating this new renewable waters that's happening outside of the uh, inlet and at places as far away as, as Harrow Strait or even Victoria Sill. And there's a propagation time that could mess up our timing quite a bit. Uh, I don't know where the, the, the water originates from, basically. But we might be able to use this timing as, as a way to find out where, where, where it comes from. So. I basically just drew these lies, lines on here at the uh, peak or the nadir of the uh, NEEP cycle. Uh, and basically you see that in the uh, sum summer months we've got uh, both monthly here uh, cycling and uh, fortnightly cycling, whereas as we head towards the, the uh, uh, winter months we get a regular what looks to be uh, during the, the peak or the spring tides, and at, at the surface layer, and the mid layer, we have that at the, at the actual neap tides. So they're out of phase, uh, quickly out of phase with each other. Also, we can see the, these mid, the, these deep uh, intrusions uh, correspond 
to sometimes a lowering of oxygen. And this is like, I think, another plot was shown where you, it, it's dangerous to be at this 100 meter depth right at the, uh, the oxygen level. So you push, you, the theory is that you push up uh, basically deoxygenated water by the influx of this new, new uh, more oxygenated water. And that's why you can get some out of phase stuff and some, some of the stuff is actually in phase with the influxes. So now if we consider the, the, the standard sort of uh, de facto kind of uh, description of Sanchez as a, a reverse estuary and you try to look at the data that we have here uh, and, and try to put a, a slightly different model onto it. Um, basically we just concentrate now on the winter months, we see a pulse in the surface uh, and then a, uh, a, a pulse in, at the deeper, deeper layer. So what I'm proposing as a model is that during spring tides, uh, water is in some manner propagated into the uh, uh, inlet to the position where the uh, boy profile is uh, and it pushes uh, now deoxygenated water out in this deeper, deeper layer and that alternates on a weekly basis, basically, with now water propagating it at a, a, a deeper depth and pushing the water out in the surface layer. So we have this back and forth reversing estuarine circulation. And that's the wild speculation here, basically. So um, if we look at the summer months here, where we, at the beginning, we have the, the same sort of uh, periods of uh, strong oxygenated water coming in during the spring tides. But we also see that there is a, as we head into the fall timing, we have these deep intrusions of oxygenated water. Uh, and that sort of appears to reverse the whole circulation here. My theory is that this stuff comes in, basically pushing the surface waters out, and we have more of a regular circulation, regular estuarine circulation, even though it's not forced by a river at the, at the, uh, um, at the head, but actually by the intrusion. Again, another speculative. Just a comment on that. I suspect because your oxygen levels are so high in the summer, that it's probably primary productivity rather than a transport of oxygen. Well, the, 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 yeah, to the range of it, but the fact that it changes on this fortnightly cycle. Yeah, it's not a transport of oxygen, it's a result of nutrients being transported. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There, we all, unfortunately, we do have uh, chlorophyll fluorescence, but I, I didn't look at that data. It's basically, it, it, it was only at the surface. I should have looked at it because then we could make that connection a lot clearer that the oxygen is, is part and, of it. And just looking at oxygen saturation of the right away too, that would be the simple calculation to do. Right. <clears throat> okay, so that's my little model. And this is basically what we have coming out now for the last, uh, uh, month or so, it's not, not even quite a month, it's, it's January 18th, and this is data available off the actual website. I just picked it up yesterday, I didn't even know it existed like this, it's pretty, uh, pretty good and stuck it on here with, with the uh, pressure at the, at, at, our, at uh, the Venus uh, instrument platform. And we see uh, basically at the uh, spring tide region we have this uh, sort of influx near the surface of more oxygenated water, so kind of following the same sort of thing that we were doing in the longer uh, period. And then in, in the sort of neap tide, we get possibly a deeper influx of, of oxygen here. But I'm sort of, uh, the point I'm trying to make with this is that the previous plots missed this very important region between the end of, or, or the beginning of February to the beginning of July, where you, we'll see whether that whole cycle will now connect back to itself or whether there's an evolving sort of multi-year uh, changes occurring. Um, if you look at the previous plots there, basically, uh, yeah, not so much there, but here, you don't see any sort of, you don't see how this, the end part here is going to uh, attach back to here. So something really big happening through this region here, the spring region, uh, probably some renewals as was, pre as, as was shown in the Caraman paper. Anyways, that's basically about it. There's a summary of what, what I've said, basically that our 
the BPS location, at least at the BPS location, a model that there's a reversing estuarine circulation happening is, is quite, uh, can be used to explain the, the structure during the winter months and possibly uh, the structure in the summer months returns into, or the fall months returns into a regular estuarine circulation due to the uh, renewal of deep waters. And that's it. And here's the actual, the, the a, a very clean uh, picture of the uh, downward-looking uh, echo sounder, and this is what I mean by uh, noisy data. Is the fact that it's only, oops, it's only penetrating down to about uh, uh, a 30 meter depth here. And I'm not sure whether that. So that's the, that. What you're seeing there is dominant. The time variable gain is saturating it. So it's just. Yes. It's ramping up and hitting the ceiling long before it needs to. So the. So that's what May was talking about, is either calibrating or changing the time variable, take, take, removing or correcting for an overzealous hardware time variable gain to take out that background gradient, which is not real so much as it's, um, we're gonna, it's right there, but it, it, has a, it has a compensation hardware in there that approximates the time variable gain and you need to sort of remove that. But it, 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 there will be a limit to that depending on yes. SNR. And so, so the question is whether we can fix that to go down deeper. Whether well, there's any signal left in there right now we and, have to. And, and, have and to the other, I don't remember what, what time it is, but it could be a lot of uh, reflectors or backscatterers there are causing this to not be able to get through that. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you.